human societies are guided and held together by ideas and a shared sense of morality. When the people lose sight of those foundational principles, corruption and dictatorial power inevitably take root. Once criminal elements have taken control of society, it becomes harder and harder to unseat them. As this process of deterioration progresses, it comes a point of no return, where real change can no longer be achieved from within the existing system. We've reached that point some time ago. It's time to come to terms with that and adjust our actions accordingly. We face a situation right now where the electoral process has become little more than theater, and the political awareness of the population has been reduced to petty bickering over emotionally charged wedges. All the while, those running the show remove our freedoms one by one and draw us ever deeper into undeclared wars of aggression. The only way that we can change course is by organizing a unified front outside the existing system. Not as a political party, not as a left-wing or right-wing ideological faction, but as a people, unified not in protest of this broken and corrupt system, but rather under a set of principles, principles that will lay the foundation to rebuild on. Any right that is a true human right is inherent. Such rights are not granted by government. They are not privileges bestowed by society or created by doctrine. Therefore, such rights cannot be regulated, limited, or revoked by any such power. Any supposed authority which seeks to strip a natural right from the people is illegitimate and should be dealt with accordingly. The most common way that rights are subverted is through the assertion of rights which are not rights at all. There was a time when it was accepted by all that kings had the right to kill at a whim and to take the freedom and the property of any of his subjects at will. The divine right of kings is a false right. This is obvious to us now. However, each era is blind to its own darkness. Before we can even begin to understand the true nature of rights, we must first answer one question honestly and follow the implications of their logical conclusion. When is violence justified? It's a simple question, and there's only one sane answer. The only morally acceptable context for violence is defense. That answer is often referred to as the non-aggression principle. It's a fancy name for an obvious and simple truth. But simple truths carry the most devastating implications when applied to the real world. Let's follow those implications and see just what it tells us about rights. Each individual owns their own life. To claim the authority to control or terminate the life of another is inherently violent. It is a claim of human ownership and it is a fundamental violation of natural rights. Up until very recently in history, the ownership of other humans was explicit. Slaves and vassals were considered the property of their lords and masters. Their labor was extracted without compensation. Their lives could be taken at any moment, and their freedom was strictly limited. Modern states exercise these same powers, but they disguise their totalitarian nature by distributing the mechanisms of violence and control through elaborate bureaucracies. The ownership of humans is no longer acknowledged outwardly, but on every practical level, it is very much in force. Torture, assassinations, and wars of aggression are the most blatant expressions of the contempt of the right to life. These acts demonstrate the perverse belief that the life of another person is theirs to destroy at will. They are the ultimate assertion of human ownership. Since your life is your own, and you are free to live as you so choose, so long as your actions do not infringe upon the rights of others. The right to liberty encompasses, but is not limited to, the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly, and the freedom of thought. The key to maintaining these freedoms is the understanding that true freedom means allowing others to make choices that we do not agree with. Since your life is your own, then your time, and that which you produce with your time, is also your own. To take the property of another by force, or the threat of force, or through fraud, is theft. To claim the authority to seize the property of another is to 
claim ownership of their labor, their time, and their life. Such claims are inherently illegitimate, regardless of whether they are made by an individual dictator or the collective dictatorship of a democracy. The right to property has very little to do with economics, but it has everything to do with how force is used in a society. The movement of goods and services may or may not involve money at all, but those exchanges must be voluntary and transparent. Non-consensual searches of one's home, transport, or person, and the surveillance of communications and personal transactions outside the investigation of a specific crime is an act of aggression. Barriers to travel, employment, health care, and other necessary functions which force individuals to waive their right to privacy are veiled forms of violence. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused have the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of their peers. All juries have the right and the responsibility to deliver their verdict in accordance with their conscience, regardless of whether that verdict contradicts written law or statutes. No legal context shall be invented or construed which bypasses the right to a civilian trial. Military detentions and assassinations of civilians, regardless of the nationality of the accused and regardless of the allegations, are direct violations of this right. The right to defense is the boundary which makes all of the rights possible. If you do not have the right to defend your life and the life of those that you love, then any of your other rights can be taken from you by anyone with the means to do so. Somewhere between 190 million and 260 million people were murdered by their own government in this past century alone. This figure far outstrips the number killed by all international and civil wars during that same time period combined. It should therefore be abundantly clear that the state cannot be trusted with the monopoly on violence and cannot be used as a substitute for the right to self-defense. All people have the right to organize their communities as they so choose in a voluntary manner, and they have the right to dissolve any political system placed over them which relies on violence to enforce its directives. In a society which adheres to the non-aggression principle, the creation and dissolution of organizational structures need not be violent. To dissolve a government is not an act of aggression, but the use of force to suppress such a movement is. When a government initiates force against the people, the people may call upon the right to self-defense. When in the course of history, a political system shows itself to be an enemy of the natural rights of the people, the people have the responsibility to dissolve that system. Stand passively by without so much as raising one's voice as the tide of tyranny rises is a betrayal of our children and our grandchildren. The first and most important step in changing the course of a culture is the spread and establishment of a new core philosophy. Each and every one of us can help make this happen by spreading these ideas. The Natural Rights Foundation is organizing towards this goal. If you would like to participate, please visit us at naturalrightsfoundation.org.